السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وبعد We praise be to Allah alone, we praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves astray No one can show him guidance Brothers and sisters, welcome to a new edition of Ask Huda uh, Our phone numbers are record 0020238552482 number should appear on the screen as well as the email address which is ask at huda.tv we have a couple of very interesting questions by the time you guys start calling us Ghazal Faisal asked I would like to know whether is it it is correct for a woman to do sajda in prayers different from men um, and if there is any authentic hadith in this regard this is a very common question uh, particularly those who are living in the West they notice that uh, people are coming from certain parts of the world. They have certain traditions, which they assume that this is the, the right way and the authentic uh, way to do it, particularly the salah. They believe that the salah of a woman should be different than the salah of a man, such as uh, a woman should not bow down in ruku' uh, all the way like a man, like halfway. Uh, in sujood, likewise, she has to collect her uh, uh, elbows to her and she has to stick her belly to the thighs while she's making sujood in order to conceal herself and so on while a man does otherwise by spreading his elbows outside and and so on I did discuss this in details in the program of the Prophet's prayer the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli pray as you have seen me praying he did not specify, he did not say, Oh you men, only men, you should pray as you've seen me praying. But women's prayer are different. No, never said so. Nor there is any specific hadith that says that the woman's prayer should be different than the prayer of a man. Unless a couple of a hadith, one of them is munkar, and the other is extremely weak, and we should not base our ruling, especially in the ibadah, on weak or fabricated a hadith. So bottom line is that the prayer of a woman is exactly similar to the prayer of a man. We're talking about the physical part and the recitation, the standing, the bound down, and the sujood, and the taslim, the entire thing. We're not talking about uh, the awra, because the awra of a man is different than the awra of a woman and what she should be covering in the, in the prayer is different than uh, a man so al jumhur and this is a more right view are of the view that there is no difference between the prayer of a man and a prayer of a woman whether in ruku' or in sujood i know that as i studied in hanafi madhab when i was in high school that there are certain differences between the prayer of a man such as she places her hands on top of her chest while a man beneath the navel and uh, these are all differences which are not supported by any sound hadith and when one wants to pray should find out how did the Prophet وسلم, offer his prayer this is deen and only the Prophet وسلم, to be followed in this regard so there is no differences between the prayer of a man and a woman and Allah knows best we have our first phone call today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Sadqa from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Sadqa. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Uh, actually, uh, I'm married since nine years, alhamdulillah. Okay. But, uh, still, we don't have any children. And all other options. Like homeopathic, Ayurvedic, allopathic, the only thing remaining is IVF, in vitro fertilization, mm -hmm. with my husband's semen. So, is that allowed in Islam? Okay, I will answer and that, secondly, inshallah. And secondly, 
Uh, actually, for before going for this procedure, I this my female gynecologist. She tried to see inside my womb, but she was unable to see it right. I'm sorry, I didn't get the second question. You're breaking off. Hello. Yes. Yeah, actually, my female gynecologist, whom I am consulting, mm -hmm. she had tried to see inside my womb, inside my uterus, but she did not succeed. And other female gynecologists are also of the same opinion that they cannot do it without the help of a male. Mm. And so I have to show to a male in presence of a female, but I don't know whether to do it or not. Yes, very confused. Okay. Thank you, Sadiqa, and I uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you a righteous offspring. Ameen. Uh, let me go ahead, uh, straight ahead, and answer Sadiqa's question. She said that she's been married for nine years. So far, she could not conceive. And the only option which is available now is the in vitro fertilization, the uh, uh, artificial fertilization. As long as... Uh, that is utilizing your egg and the sperm of the husband, there is no external or uh, the sperm of another male or an egg of another female, and that would be inoculated once again in your own uterus, then inshallah it is permissible if it is the last result. And since you are following up with a female gynecologist, then I believe, and Allah knows best, this is permissible. You're not doing anything that antagonizes Allah's uh, wish. Because making an attempt in order to conceive as long as it is through halal means is permissible. But I have a word that I wanted to share with you. And every couple who've been trying to have uh, a child, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not uh, decide for them. I was about to say did not bless them with a child, but maybe he actually blessed them by not having the child. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, in Surah Al-Kahf, Al-Khadr went ahead and got hold of this young boy and he killed him. Then when Musa alayhi salam was very angry and he questioned the wisdom behind it, he said, you just killed an innocent soul. He said, well, I will explain to you later as we discussed earlier. Uh, and uh, in the course of explaining, he said that this child, Allah knew that he was going to be a wicked child and he was going to give his parents a very hard time and a disbeliever child. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to give them a better replacement. And that means also the child will be saved. So I want everybody who's going through the dilemma of uh, not having children to think about it this way. It could be better. It may be better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. You may dislike something while it is good for you. Would it be better to have a child who is a aq? Or he would convert from Islam to disbelief? Would give you a hard time since he's born, he's wicked? That happens. I have some parents who say, I wish that we did not have such child. And maybe because of being patient for not having uh, the child and uh, accepting Allah's decree with pleasure that too is a cause of rewarding you and admitting you to his paradise so we need to agree to this fact that number one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best if he decided for us to have the child we are grateful if he deprived us it is because of his wisdom either to test us or perhaps if the child were to come he would be bad it would be wicked, uh, similar to the case of Prophet Nuh salam, with his son who had been given da'wah along with his people for 950 years and by the end he died in a state of disbelief. And when he begged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Rabbi in abni min ahli, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade him from asking for forgiveness for his own son and he warned him that don't you ever ask for forgiveness for him because he's not your son nor is he from your family anymore. So as far as I answer to the question, yes, it is permissible. But those who are going through this dilemma of not having uh, children, been trying to conceive for years, just make dua 
and be reasonable in your du'a. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you what's best and he knows best whether it is good for you to have or not to have the children. And I'm going to repeat what I always say. The Quran said the best mean of asking Allah to give you the goodly offspring is to make plenty of istighfar. To ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek his forgiveness day and night. فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدُكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا In addition to seeking the medical means which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permit. هذا والله أعلم. Another phone call. Saba from United Arab Emirates. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم. I hear you, sister. Yeah, so, uh, Dr. Sheikh Salah, I wanted to ask you one question. Uh, I have been uh, very, very ill from the last two years. I have been suffering from irritable bowel syndrome where I alternately get uh, different bowel patterns. And because of this, my health and my, all my daily activities have been hampered. I have been doing uh, istighfar daily and uh, uh, from the last three years, I have come more to close towards Islam. I am also observing hijab and earlier I was not such a devout Muslim. But since I have come into the folds of Islam, I understand that now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing me. I have read in the Quran that, um, uh, you, you know, whatever good happens is decreed by Allah and whatever bad happens is earned by one's own soul. So am I being punished for my past sins or what? Because most of, sometimes I lose my hope, I lose my morale and I am uh, totally depressed because of my illness. And uh, I don't understand whether, when this is all going to end. Can you please guide me with regards to this? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sister Saba. Uh, Brother Altaf from uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Altaf. Wa alaikum assalam. Sheikh, I have two questions. Please go ahead. Uh, I have a property in India. Mm. Okay. And, and an Indian bank has approached me to lend it on rent. You know the, you know the bank in India do business on interest. Mm-hmm. So is it permissible for me to rent it out to the bank? Okay. First and second one is uh, when we visit the gra- uh, graves of righteous people like valis and including prophets, what acts are we permissible to, and what are not, uh, and what are not? Are we allowed to make manat duas? Okay. That's all. Thank you, Altaf. Okay. Uh, Sister Saba, may Allah give you shifa. I ask Allah the Great to give you an instant cure. Amen. The Quran says, "Ma asabaka min hasanatin fa min Allah, wa ma asabaka min sayyatin fa min nafsik." Whatever befalls you of good, it is from Allah, and whatever befalls you of bad or evil, it is because of your earning, because of your own self. But whatever happens in the heavens or on earth is all decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ كُلٌّ مِّنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ فَمَا لِهَا الْقَوْمِ لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ حَدِيثًا So the meaning of the first verse, it is as a result of our earning, of our bad doing. وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Allah uh, may punish His servants for their evil and bad doings by afflicting them with adversity, with sickness, with hardship, and he pardons a lot. And But this is not always the case. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests somebody, it could be because of either his sins or because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to elevate him in ranks. We have the greatest example, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was pure and sinless, who was the purest, and obviously all the messengers and prophets. He was infallible. Meanwhile, he was tested more than anybody else. And the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا أَحَبَّ عَبَدًا إِبْتَلَاهُ مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرٍ يُصِبْ مِنْهُ If Allah loves somebody, He will try him. He will test him. 
and he will continue to test him until he will purify him or her from their sins. Nothing afflicts the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the believer, but it is good for him. Whether it's a major disease, terminal ailment, chronic sickness, or even a flu, or a nail or a thorn that may penetrate his skin and hurt him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remits some of our sins as a result of being tested and being patient for these tests. Having a irritable bowel syndrome, there are millions of people who are having these syndromes. But the difference between these millions, there are some who are patient and grateful, thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say, Alhamdulillah, I'm much better than others. When they pay a visit to somebody who has a chronic tumor, uh, who has a malignant tumor, or leukemia, or, 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 they say, Alhamdulillah, I'm much better than others. And that's why, brothers and sisters, I'm going to give you a very valuable advice. Please do not skip a single week without paying a visit to the hospital. Tumor centers. People who are suffering, whether you know them or not, just for the sake of Allah, pick up some gifts, some flowers, and go and visit people. Take your children and your youngsters and speak to the school council and say that we want to make a trip to an orphanage, to a hospital. See people who are really suffering in order to appreciate Allah's countless blessings upon you. It may be somebody who is having some flu, and the flu lasted for a week or two or three. And he says, I have an asthma, or I cannot breathe, or, 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 or. When you visit somebody who is suffering more than you, then you appreciate Allah's ni'am, which are countless. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, always compare yourselves to those who are lesser than you in fortune, not to those who are more fortunate than you. Lest you may belittle Allah's favors and ni'am upon you. When you compare yourself to those who are less fortunate than you, then you feel yourself very rich, very healthy, lucky. You are the luckiest person. I'm not saying that we should not seek the means of remedy. No, tadawa. Seek the best medication if it is possible. But if it lasts and you give a, yourself a ruqya and you ask people to pray for you and uh, righteous people give ruqya to you and all of that and you place your palm on the spot which is aching or suffering and you say, Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from everything that I fear and I suffer from. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min sharri ma ajidu wa uhadhir. You say that three times. And you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure you seven times. As'alu Allah al-Azim, Rabb al-Ash al-Azim, an yashfika if you're praying for somebody else, the second person. Seven times. Reciting Quranic verses, Ayatul Kursi, Surah Al-Fatiha, and Mu'awadat, etc. You've done your part, alhamdulillah. If it lasts, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to purify me. We have countless sins that we did not feel them. We do not know how much, how many mountains of bad deeds and laws that we have. So this means of purification, we welcome them, them with pleasure. And this is a very trait which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes in a believer. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa admired the believer who behaves like us in this regard. Assalamu alaikum, we have a couple of phone calls. Um Hadi from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam, brother. How are you? Uh, how are you? Alhamdulillah, wa shukrillah. Uh, I have two questions. I just heard from someone, uh, they said that it's not allowed for a Muslim woman to wear rings in the index finger and in the middle finger. I don't know if that's yeah, right or not. You're talking about the thumb and the middle finger, right? No, the index finger, the finger of shahada. In both the hands, uh, the index finger and the middle finger. Okay, index and the middle. Yes. And uh, that's the first question. And the second question is that, is it uh, compulsory to wear socks during prayers? Like, according to any school of thought, can we pray without wearing socks? Okay. For a woman. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Brother Muhammad from uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum, Salaam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? 
Uh, uh, here you, Muhammad. My neighbor is a non-Muslim Hindu. So, can I give you a Quran which is in Arabic and English translation? I'm trying my best to uh, uh, comprehend your question. You said that you have a Hindu friend that you're asking whether is it permissible to give him a Quran with the English meaning, right? Okay, I assume that was the question. Muhammad's phone call was cut off. Okay. Al-Taf from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is asking about renting a property to a bank. And you know what does the bank do? A conventional bank. He said, is it permissible? Okay. I guess those who have been following us for years now, they can predict the answer. And the answer with the proof. Surah Al-Ma'idah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ He began by saying, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالْتَقْوَى وَلَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ this balance equation which regulates the haram and halal. If you have any doubt or any confusion, put this ayah at work, you will be able to find the answer. Help one another to do what's good, what's righteous. But help not one another. Do not assist each other in achieving al-ithm wal-udwan. Sins and transgression. So you know what the bank does. Is it haram or halal? Haram. And you know that. Then assisting the bank is haram. Renting the property to the bank is haram. Having an access to deposit your money in a, an Islamic-based uh, bank, meanwhile you choose that bank, is haram. Okay? So do not help one another to, to do or to achieve or to fulfill what's haram, or what's sin, or what's transgression. There is one of the means of predicting the ahkam in the principles of jurisprudence is known as blocking the means, saddu dhara'ah. Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him, said that whenever Allah prohibits anything, He prohibits anything that may lead to it. It is not permissible for a farmer who grows grapes to sell it to somebody who knows that he's going to squeeze it and make wine out of it. But I'm just selling the grapes. But you know what he's going to do with it. Then it is haram. A truck driver who's carrying the wine, he's not drinking, he's not selling it, but he's involved in the prohibition and in the curse of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So لا تعاونوا على الإثم والعد والعد وان. السلام عليكم. Farhan from United Arab Emirates. السلام عليكم. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. How are you, Farhan? الحمد لله. How are you? Great. الحمد لله. شكر الله. All right. Sheikh, I have one or two questions. One is that we have been told, you know, that we have to love Allah and Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam more than our Parents. Now, uh, you know, uh, being a human being, uh, it is, uh, uh, we love our children, for example, extremely, and we can feel it in our heart. Mm. What are the ways uh, to reach and achieve that love that is required? That's number one. And number two, how can we feel in our heart that we are getting that love, or we have, our love has been accepted mm. uh, by Allah, in a sense? That's one thing. Now, second thing is a different one. Uh, it's regarding the, the last uh, episode, you know. Uh, one sister asked the question about the groups in Pakistan and, you know, other countries. Uh, and uh, you didn't answer the question about that they don't pray behind the Imam of the Makkah. Now, my question is vice versa. Are we allowed to pray behind those people who actually uh, have the famous belief that these prophets are alive in the grave and the Holy Allahs are alive, you know? No. Are we allowed to no. pray behind those no, uh, it is not permissible to pray behind them because they are not considered Muslims. Okay? okay. If, right. if, somebody, if somebody believes that the one in the grave, whomsoever is that one, can help, can benefit, they seek their help, they pray to them, they ask them to assist them, then they have the shirk practice. If they believe so, if we clarify to them and they insist on that, to the extent that they do not pray behind uh, Ahlul Sunnah, and particularly the Imam of the Haram. So they chose to be a part of our mainstream Ummah. Okay? I just answer you uh, uh, immediately because the question was related yeah. to, a question was asked yesterday, and it's a lengthy one, so I just wanted to uh, answer you immediately. Okay, thank there you for... One more last, last question, if you don't mind. That's one more. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, this um, the uh, I asked this question before you answered it about this uh, medical insurance. Uh, but tell me whether it is allowed to go with the takaful. The takaful that is going. The takaful, which is a cooperative insurance, is yes. If okay. it if it is the actual uh, takaful or cooperative insurance. Uh, following the Islamic rules, then of course uh, it is permissible and it is recommended to. Okay. Thank okay. you, Farhan. Jazakallah uh, khairan. Brother uh, Awal from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Awal. Aminu alaikum, assalamu wa rahmatullah. Please go ahead. Uh, I have one question, and the next one is not a question, it's a favor. I hear you. Which I want from you. Uh, my first question is, is regarding election. Is it allowed, is it permissible in Islam for a Muslim to elect a non-Muslim? And if it is haram, what is the gravity of the haram? Does it take you away from Islam? Or you are still in uh, a Muslim or a sinner? That's number one. Okay. That's my first question. And the next one is, uh, I would like you to do me that favor of giving me Dr. Zakir Naik of India, his phone number. Okay. Yeah. As far as the so second I am, one... I am, uh, me, I am interested in comparative religion, and I want to meet him. Okay. As far as the second one, I don't have it handy, but I guess you can uh, search it online. Or try to call the, the control, maybe they have it. Okay? But inshallah, I'll get to answer your question. Sister Arjia from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum. Wa, wa alaikum assalam. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. Yeah. I just want, uh, I asked this question before, but uh, somehow that day you didn't answer. And after that, um, maybe I missed. The question was about Qasr Salah. When we are traveling, uh, are we supposed to shorten our, our Salah? And is it a wajib or sunnah? And because one of my relatives told me that we cannot do it, we have to pray full for Raka's mm. first prayer. Mm. And my number, uh, second question is, uh, Am I permissible to see you in the TV or any uh, non-mahram men when I'm uh, watching? Is it uh, permissible for me? Okay. And that is my second question. Thank May you, Allah Sister Aji. Thank Jannat. you. Allah khairan. Thank you so much. Um, it seems like I got lost. I filled uh, already one sheet and I'm in the second one. So I'll try my best, inshallah, to uh, uh, answer those questions. Alta from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia's second question was the etiquette of visiting the graveyard. What is permissible and what is prohibited? Uh, visiting the graveyard is a sunnah. Is encouraged by the Prophet ﷺ in order to receive the admonition and to be reminded with the shortness of this life and to realize that soon you will join them. Even in the dua which the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say upon entering the graveyard, Assalamu alaikum ahl al diyar, min al mu'minin wal muslimin, wa inna insha Allah bikum lahiqun, nasal Allah lana wa lakum al afiyah. Peace be with you, the dwellers of these homes, of the Muslims and the believers. Soon, insha Allah, we will join you. We will die and we'll be buried too. We ask Allah to pardon us and to pardon you. This is the prescribed dua that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say and he taught Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha ardaha and he taught us to say upon entering the, uh, the graveyard. Now, anything else such as trying to communicate with the dead, what people think that, uh, as I just answered uh, Brother Farhan from Emirates, that they believe that they can help even if he was the most righteous man, even if it was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that is prohibited. That is prohibited. They, in, they are in need for our dua, and they cannot assist us by any means. And that's why we go and we pray for them. 
And that's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said upon burying some of his companions, he said, استغفروا لأخيكم فإنه الآن يسأل. He asked the companions to hang over for some time to seek forgiveness from Allah for their companion who just buried because he's helpless. He needs assistance, he needs that prayer. Can you pray for them in the graveyard? Yes, you can pray for them. But asking from them is entirely antagonizing the Islamic teaching and our belief. Okay. Uh, another thing, which is, if women happen to go to the graveyard, they must understand that uh, wailing and crying out loud and making some remarks which seem as an objection to Allah's decree, this is also forbidden. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to that woman who was mourning the death of her son, he said, اتق الله واصبري Fear Allah and be patient. And that's why if a woman cannot control her emotions, then she should not go. Ali from um, Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Ali. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa rahmatullah. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. Uh, may Allah give you a long, healthy life. Ameen. And you too. Uh, Ameen. Uh, thank you again for all the efforts of Huda TV in spreading the name, Amen. spreading uh, the haq and the truth. I would like to ask uh, the question last time I couldn't get the answer. Uh, this is regarding a lot of people who go out for uh, dawah for three days, 40 days and four months okay. in the path of Allah. What do the scholars say about this? Uh, quickly, Ali, uh, let me take this phone call, inshallah, and I'll answer you afterward. Umar from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, Umar? Uh, I have three questions, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, first one. Uh, should a person say, I mean, after reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, uh, silently and start with Nafal prayer? Okay. Uh, second one, should a person recite Surah Al-Fatiha after the Imam recites the Surah in a congregational prayer? And uh, the third one is, uh, I've seen some people uh, praying to Rakhah, so I've seen the prayer of Fajr. Is this permissible? I'm sorry, I missed the third question. Oh, uh, sorry. I have seen some uh, people praying uh, two rakahs of Sunnah prayer after Fajr. After Fajr? Yes. You mean yes. they're making up the two rakahs before Fajr that they missed? Yes. Okay. Is it permissible? And uh, that's all. That's exactly what I have. Wajazakum. Thank you. Ali, I did not forget your question, but we got to go for a short break. So, inshallah, right after the break, I'll begin by answering question. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyihi wa mustafa wa ba'd. Brother Ali from Canada asked the question which was presented many, many times. And as I said, the answer is already posted um, on our uh, website and in writing too. With regards to the permissibility of going for three days or four days, 40 days or four months for da'wah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this ummah is distinguished from any other ummah and have been chosen because of the quality of delivering the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ You're the best ummah produced to mankind because you enjoy what's right and you forbid what's evil and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Qur'an to say, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبِحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is my way. I call unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ With an insight, with wisdom, with a proper understanding with following the same prophetic methodology of giving da'wah, me and those who follow me. So every follower of Prophet Muhammad is required to enjoin what's right 
and forbid what's evil. That is summarized in one word, to give da'wah. To call people to Allah and to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Since the greatest da'iyah, the first caller to Allah was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we study in the seerah, when we study in the entire collection of the sound ahadith, we learn a lot how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave da'wah in every field, in peace and in war, to adults, to minors, to men, to women, to children. So we learn a lot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا our best, our model, is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So why shall we figure out a new way to do any act of worship while the deen has been completed? Says who that you have to stick to three days because some people believe that it is a must to go out for three days every month and 40 days a year and four, four months per, per life. And if you, do not, if you do not do that, then you did not fulfill the command of Allah of delivering the message. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً Convey and give balagh and give da'wah, even if all what you know is ayah, just deliver it. So, we do not specify that I have to go out for three days. The work of jama'at al-tabliq, or tabliq jama'at, is so great. They can reach to people that we as you and the scholars and the professors of Islamic studies cannot reach. They do a magnificent job. But wouldn't it be better if we adhere to the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Why do we have to commit ourselves to three days or 40 days or four months? That does not exist in the sunnah. So this part is not prescribed in the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And I remember the brothers, whenever they used to come and visit me and other scholars in their Islamic centers, initially some of them who uh, were new, they would say that, Shaykh, why don't you join us? I said, in what? In giving da'wah. Well, I thought I'm already giving da'wah. Or do I have to move from one place to another? We see there was an ishtima or a big meeting where we see non-Arabic speakers are coming to the Arabic countries to give da'wah via an interpreter. And the Arab are going to India and Pakistan to give da'wah via an interpreter or interpreters. So why don't the local people who are fully aware of the society, the culture, and their traditions give da'wah to, the, to their local people? Yeah, we know that the Sahaba spread all over and most of the Sahaba were buried outside the Medina. True. Because there was no dua. There was nobody to convey the message of the Prophet ﷺ and the deen to others other than them. So when I go to a Muslim country to give da'wah through an interpreter, why? It's a simple question that needs an answer. Everybody knows how to read the book of Riyadh al-Salihin in Arabic, in English, in Urdu, in French. So why do I have to get somebody to spend a lot of money and stay away from his family and go here and there? Traveling in order to meet with people and get to know different cultures and strengthen the ties, all of that is perfect. But to make it an obligatory task and considering this similar to uh, the mandate of performing Hajj or Umrah or so, that's absolutely rejected and refused. If I speak the language of the people and I'm invited to Pakistan or India where I speak either English or Urdu, I'll be more than happy. To Malaysia, be more than happy. I have something to benefit the local people with. But when people who have no knowledge whatsoever travel and keep traveling from one place to another, all what they possess is a few statements. Yesterday they were heavy smokers. Some maybe were addicts. Alhamdulillah, the Tabligh brothers brought them into the folds of Islam, taught them how to pray. Is that sufficient? Do they possess the qualities and the proper tools to give da'wah? You know the hadith which says, Give balagh even if all what you know is one ayah. If you know it, and do not exceed this one ayah. Do not exceed this one ayah. And we differentiate it between a da'iyah, and an imam, and a mufti, and a qari, and a scholar. Everyone is specialized in his field. 
enjoining what's right and forbidding what's evil which is given down in general is the duty of every Muslim. If you know for sure this is right, then you should enjoin it with the proper way. ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن. So if you know that this is haram for sure, then you should forbid it. Enjoin what's right and forbid what's evil. But the problem is when somebody is not fully aware of the haram and the halal, and he thinks what's cultural is religious, and he starts giving commands that we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to, uh, uh, to travel for 40 days in order to prove that we are believers. No, I don't have to. When I travel and I stay in one place and I teach without limiting myself to a certain number of days, I'm conveying the message. So they come to me and other shaykh and say, you need to go out for khuruj. Subhanallah, I'm already in khuruj. I left my family and my home, not for three days or 40 days or for four months, lifetime. Do I still have to go to another locality for three days and so on? Meaning that moving and making an effort to give da'wah, if you have the proper tools, and if you have the means, and you believe that this locality needs your da'wah, is a must, if you have all the means. But specify a certain number of days, it cannot. No one have an access to do that. Even if the greatest shaykh in life have said it is prescribed, then one is required to present a proof that the Prophet ﷺ said so. This is one part. He asked about the numbers. Now, it does not exist in the Sharia. The effort of giving da'wah is required from everybody. The intention of our tabligh brothers, no one can doubt their intention because they're not drinking. They're not organizing soccer game or a tournament. They're going for da'wah. But the problem is that effort has to be put in the proper mold, which is the sunnah. Follow the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ. Da'wah is not limited to the virtuous acts and the good deeds and to a certain book. No. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the sound hadith which is narrated by Tamim ibn Aws in al-Dari whose nickname is Abu Ruqayya al-Din al-Nasiha al-Din al-Nasiha al-Din our religion is in one word is to pay the sincere advice. Sincerity in giving an advice, sincerity in fulfilling what Allah commanded, sincerity in abstaining from whatever Allah prohibited. قُلْنَا لِمَنْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ The companion said, to whom shall we give the nasih? He said, لِلَّهِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِأَئِمَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَعَامَّةِ وَلِكِتَابِهِ وَلِأَئِمَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَعَامَّتِهِمْ So we do not exclude any person, even if it was the imam himself, or the president, or the ruler. Or we do not speak in politics, why not? We do not address the subject of jihad. Why not? Isn't it a part of our deen? Shouldn't we explain to people? When does jihad become compulsory? When does supporting the Muslim ummah becomes obligatory and imminent? We do not exclude any subject of the deen. We need to teach aqidah, the proper aqidah, the proper belief. We need to tell people that invoking the dead is haram. No, no, we're not talking about that because that offends certain people. Then what kind of da'wah is this? What kind of da'wah is this? Is it only limited to bringing people to join us so that we can travel from one place to another? No. We bring people into the fall of Islam, make them learn how to pray, how to read the Qur'an proper. It's really uh, tough to see somebody who's giving da'wah and cannot recite al muawizat And when we sit in halqa for tajweed, they do not know how to read a chapter of the Qur'an. Why? Because I dedicated my entire life for khuj and da'wah. No. We need those who will get up to speak and give the bayan, the scholars. The scholars, because when somebody stands up, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ya ummu al-qawma aqra'uhum. These are the proper uh, tools. Not because just somebody grew his beard and put on a shirwal qameez or a tobe or an outfit, a particular outfit, he became a scholar. And that's another dilemma. I remember once in Texas, I was praying in one masjid, on one brother, after the salah turned around to give bayan. He was reading from the book of Riyadh al-Salihin. 
Reading the hadith itself and saying the English meaning is perfectly fine. May Allah bless you for that, if this is all what you know. But volunteering to give the sharh, the explanation of the hadith, and making an error is a disaster. Because you never know. I myself was traveling. So if I'm not aware of the true explanation of the hadith, and I heard it from you, then I understood it wrong. It is engraved in my mind. And I may transmit it to another person, to a third, and so on. So because of one person that he spread some false information in the name of the deen, in the name of giving da'wah. So when we ask the person, why did he say this? He said, this is what he thought. This is what he thought. No. Deenullah Azza Jal is a big amana. And only trustworthy people who are qualified to convey this message, who are aware of the meaning of what they say. In order to be an MD, you have to graduate from a medical school. To be an engineer, to be a lawyer, you have to study. So studying the deen, even if you study with the shaykh, that's your degree. If you have an ijazah from a shaykh that says that you perfected this kind of science, fiqh or hadith or tafsir or seerah, that shows that you know. Not reading a book or two on your own and volunteering to lead people and go for khuruj. It's a very heavy task. And in order to be rewarded for it, then please do not limit yourself to one or two books. And when we advise some of our brothers that the book which you are reading constantly is full of fabricated hadith. Nowadays, it is very easy and accessible for everybody to know the hadith, whether it's sound or weak. So why shall we resort to fabricated hadith, not just weak, in order to support the virtuous acts and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in order to do them? We don't have to. Actually, we should not do that. So there are certain things need to be taken in consideration in order to do the perfect da'wah. I taught a course which is known as methodology of da'wah and I'm still teaching with the Sharia Academy. For a person who would like to undertake the mission of da'wah professionally, you should not proceed on in giving da'wah professionally and traveling in conferences and in meetings unless you study the method that the Prophet ﷺ gave da'wah. Stemming from both the Qur'an and the Sunnah. By the end, I do not forget to say that I believe the brothers who dedicate a great part of their time for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're very, very sincere. But these advices are also sincere from somebody who studied the deen in order to correct our way of giving da'wah. Wallahu ta'ala, a'la wa a'lam. Um, Umm Hani from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, asked about wearing a ring in the index finger and the middle finger, the index, the pointing finger, and in the middle finger. Is it permissible? No, it is not. The Prophet ﷺ and the hadith is collected by Imam Muslim forbade one of his companions from wearing the ring in the finger which he points with in the tashahud, in the salah, nor in the middle finger. And the scholars say the prohibition is for dislikeness. Karahatu tahrim. So it is not permissible. Well, um, I believe that we ran out of time. I'm sorry I cannot hear the director. But I would uh, uh, quickly answer the last question of hers, which is covering the feet in the salah, or do women have to wear socks uh, in the prayer? As Umm Salama explained in the hadith, when the question was presented to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, if she's wearing an outer garment or a dara' sabigh that is long enough to cover the feet, then she does not have to wear socks, which means it is required for women to cover their feet in the salah, either by wearing socks or by wearing long garments or aba'a that covers. Yes, there are some of the scholars who do not require covering the socks, but the more right view and Allah knows best that it is required أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate test.
Ultimate test. Permit me to pass the ultimate test. 